Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations in our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Now, uh, if you haven't caught on yet, I'm not going to read the book of Esther or from it. Um, but instead, we're going to kind of walk through the book and pick out some important learnings this morning. A little bit different approach to messages than I have used, uh, normally used. Uh, I mentioned this last week, and uh, some of you caught on to it when, uh, while we were at the picnic. God is never directly mentioned in the book of Esther. Never. One of two books in the Bible. Anybody remember what the other one is? The Song of Solomon. Song of Songs, yeah. Um, but, uh, but it is obvious throughout this book of Esther that God is working behind the scenes. I want you to keep an eye out for that as we move through today's message. Starting in Esther chapter 1, verse 1, where it says, This is what happened during the time of Xerxes, who ruled over 127 provinces stretching from India to the Nile. Now, not all translations have his name as Xerxes. Uh, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it because I'll fumble it, but some other translations call him Azaharius or something like that. Yeah, uh, same guy. Now, Xerxes, at the beginning of this uh, book of Esther, is throwing a banquet for his noblemen. They were, I, I told Garfield Green that I was going to be preaching on Esther this week, and he says, oh, the party book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the, the, the book starts with, Xerxes throwing a banquet for his noblemen. There are three banquets in the first chapter of Esther alone. Three parties. The first one, for 180 days, Xerxes displays the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and glory of his majesty. Six months of serious partying. Wow. Yeah. And then, but wait, there's more. He threw another party for the whole capital, everybody who lived there, open to the common people so that they would be overwhelmed. Wine was served in goblets of gold. Each guest could drink as much as they wanted. No restrictions, no restraint, unlimited royal wine. Does this sound like a heck of a party or what? Yeah. Meanwhile, Xerxes' queen... Queen Vashti was throwing a third banquet, this one for the women. Now this banquet sounds like it was maybe a little more restrained, no excesses, no silly juvenile behavior. Here comes your first sermon note. So after days of partying, the king was merry with wine. That's, that's code for drunk. <laughs> And he sent for Queen Vashti so he could show off his ultimate possession. That's the word there, possession. Doesn't that make you feel good? So did he want to show off her brains? Have her do complex math problems? Maybe lead a lively discussion of the decline of the Babylonian Empire? No. Verse 11 says he wanted to show her off. For she was fair to behold. Humiliation much for the queen? What do you think? And then comes the unthinkable. Vashti says, no. <laughs> you know, parade myself in front of your drunken buddies after seven days of Miller time? I don't think so. That's cool. Yeah, I'll stay home and wash my hair, thank you. <laughs> So does the king at that point say, okay, Vashti, I see your point. This will be horribly awkward for you. Sorry I brought it up. No. <laughs> Not his reaction at all. The king was furious. The Bible says burned with anger because he, she threatened his royal authority, threatened his manhood, made him look weak. Not a good look. The most powerful guy in that part of the world can't control his wife. So the king consults his wisest advisors, what am I going to do about my wife? I can't do a thing with her. 
If word gets out about this, all the men, all, I'm sorry, all the wives in the kingdom, they're going to they're gonna hear this and they're going to rebel against their husbands. Can't have that. So here comes a sermon note. These advisors tell him to issue a royal order that Vashti is not allowed, that's allowed, to come before the king anymore. <laughs> Think that's going to break her heart? Because uh, that's, that's exactly what she wasn't doing in the first place. The thinking was here that when the king's edict on this is proclaimed throughout his vast and magnificent realm, all the women will now respect their husbands. Yeah, from the, from the least to the greatest, right? Yeah, that'll work. Now, what a bunch of flatterers these advisors are. Uh, they know all about the king's Ego, I haven't talked about that, his appearance, his pleasure. See, the king has surrounded himself with a bunch of yes men. Nobody is going to say to him, uh, maybe we should think about this, your highness. This, this might not be such a good idea. Nobody's going to do that. And here comes a sermon note. Here's this thing about organizations, and I've experienced this. The higher you rise in an organization, the less truth Truth is the word you're likely to hear. One of the surest signs of trouble is when the people under the leader are more concerned about the leader's perception of reality than they are about reality itself. Searching for truth and finding truth tellers is one of the leader's greatest challenges, including in our church today. Okay, now we've gotten through chapter one. Time for chapter two. To get a new queen, Xerxes gets advice, not from his original advisors. Who's he go to? His drinking buddies. <laughs> and their answer is to, let's hold a beauty contest and have every one of the 127 provinces in the realm send one, one finalist to the royal harem. And at the end, sermon note, the girl who pleases the king would become the ultimate trophy wife. Wow. Now, I know from, from today, it would be just impossible to believe that there was once a culture so superficial that middle-aged men would try to impress other people by showing off their wealth and power, by attracting a wife with youth and beauty, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Astounding, isn't it? Nothing, nothing so depraved would ever happen today, yeah? <laughs> anyway. So one of the contestants is this young Jewish girl named Esther, an orphan who was adopted and raised by her cousin Mordecai. And she was fair, and she was beautiful, and she made it through the preliminary rounds to be one of the finalists to go before the king. And friends, we are, you got to read this, we are talking a crazy preparation process. Now I'm going to ask a, a question. Ladies, uh, think back. Did you ever spend more than 15 minutes getting ready for a date? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Um... You ever spend more than an hour getting ready for a date? Yeah. 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 Or spend more time getting ready than you actually spent on the date? <laughs> <laughs> okay. And did you ever have more fun getting ready for the date than you actually had on the date? <laughs> oh, my. But I'm just teasing a little bit. But check Esther, chapter 2, verse 12 before a girl's turn came to go into King Xerxes. She had a complete, get this, 12 months of beauty treatments, and six months with oil of myrrh, six months with perfumes and cosmetics. I mean, good thing they didn't have things like liposuction and Botox, right, in those days. No pressure on these girls at all, right? Anyway, so this young, obscure, orphan Jewish girl makes it through all of that. Esther pleases the king. She's made queen, 
And now her mission was to be eye candy for the most powerful man on earth. So the king throws another party, and Esther lives happily ever after, right? You would be wrong if you believe that. There is another story. There's another character in this story, a guy named Haman. He is Xerxes' chief of staff, and this guy has some real, and I mean real, anger issues. Sermon note. He is mortally offended because there is one man who will not bow down and give him worship, and it is, here's your sermon note, Mordecai, Esther's guardian. Now Haman is so angry that he offers King Xerxes an enormous bribe. He's going to pay him off so that the king would give him permission to destroy Mordecai and Mordecai's people. The king's response, yeah, whatever, your call. But by the way, he never told the king who he was going to wipe out. So the king never knew who this was. I want you to hold that thought. Now word of that eventually got to Mordecai, and he realized that Esther is the only one who can save Israel. They were in captivity here. Esther, the harem girl, the beauty queen. Mordecai challenges Esther to have the courage to go to the king and save her people. And friends, Esther does not want to do this. You see, unless the king first extends his gold scepter, giving permission, sermon note here, approaching the king uninvited is a capital offense. Death penalty offense. And it strikes Esther as maybe not very smart to do that. What do you think? Especially if you're going to tell him you don't like the way he's doing his job. Kings have never been real open to public criticism. Now, there's something that even Mordecai, in his communications with Esther, that he didn't know. It seems the king by this time had not summoned Esther for 30 days. Yeah, they're husband and wife, but she hasn't seen him in more than a month. And we're not exactly talking a devoted husband here, are we? The excitement has worn off. The king is maybe not as excited about Esther as he once was. And a lot of people would give up at this point but not Mordecai. Chapter 4, Mordecai challenges Esther. He says, love these words that are coming up here. Do not think, Esther, that because you are in the king's house, that you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief, get this, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. Hint, God will save his people some other way. But meanwhile, you and your father's family will perish. And then we read these fabulous words. Sermon note. Perhaps you have come to your royal position, royal position, for such a time as this. Mordecai is saying, look, Esther, listen. The fate of God's people is in your hands. You have not been brought to this time just for an exquisite wardrobe and precious gems and exotic fragrances. You have not been brought to this time to become the most desirable, most attractive, most applauded woman in the kingdom. You have not been brought to this time for any of the reasons that the king thinks you have. Nope. You have been brought to this point to work for justice. And to spare people a great suffering. You have been brought to this point to oppose a man who is vile and evil and supremely powerful. You have a mission, Esther, and your mission matters. You have been brought to this point in your life to be a part of God's plan to redeem the world. 
Friends, you and I need a Mordecai in our lives. Somebody who can help keep you focused on where you need to be, call you out when you're messing up, to celebrate your successes, help learn from your failures. failures. And Mordecai does just that for Queen Esther. And then comes Esther's response to Mordecai. Another great moment in this story. Mordecai, she says, I hope you're ready for this. Mordecai, sermon note, get all the Jews together and start fasting and praying for three days and three nights. Fasting and praying. And she says, I'll do the same here in the palace with my friends and servants. And then I will go to the king, even if it is against the law. Esther wants to have three days of fasting and prayer because maybe she's found that being queen isn't all about power and status and glory. It's really about sacrifice and serving. And she's going to need strength beyond herself for this. Isn't it interesting that she refuses to try to achieve this mission based on her beauty and her cleverness and her influence, even though they're great? Stop and ask you a question here. When is the last time you or our church had an extended period of prayer, maybe fasting and prayer, to ask God for clarity and courage about the mission that he has called you to, knowing you have been called to for such a time as this? I've never personally tried fasting. It's not a diet. It's a whole different concept. But lots of people find what, when you need God's guidance and direction, prayer and fasting are incredibly powerful. So Esther finally says, after that reply, sermon note here, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. If I perish, I perish. So be it. Astounding courage. Now chapter 5. After those three days, Esther puts on her royal robes, and she stands in the inner court waiting for the king. And she doesn't know. She does not know if she'll have another day. Her life was in the balance here. The king sees her and lets her live. What is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even if it is half the kingdom, I will give it to you. Uh-huh. In the culture of that day, this is king talk for, I'm in a good mood. <laughs> maybe, was this a real offer? You can have half the kingdom. Or maybe it was more like, uh, Esther, you can be in charge of the remote tonight. <laughs> now, Esther knew she wasn't going to get away with asking for half the kingdom. So instead, she invites King Xerxes and advisor Haman to a party. Now, the king has never turned down a party invite in his life, has he? So he and Haman, they go to her party, and they have a great time. And the king at this party repeats his offer of half the kingdom. Now, says Esther, and she speaks in kind of um, third-person language here. It's, in, it's this way in the Bible, too, as you read it. Says Esther, if the king regards me with favor, if the king wishes to grant my request, let the king and Haman come to another banquet <laughs> that I shall prepare tomorrow, and I will answer the king's request. Esther's showing some real boldness, intelligence, great timing. Now, Haman. Sermon note coming here. Haman is very excited, all puffed up about this. He goes to his wife and friends. He brags to them about all of his honors and achievements, all of his wealth. And then he says, all that means nothing. Nothing. As long as Mordecai does not bow to me or tremble in fear when he sees me. And friends, we see Haman's problem in our society today. It's the problem, and I talk about this from time to time, it's the problem of more. 
More wealth, more power, more applause, more status, more honors, more, more, more. If I can get that one more thing, it'll be enough. But it's never enough. Our society bombards us with this need for more, doesn't it? Friends, the constant need for more gives you a chronic sense of soul dissatisfaction. It never brings deep contentment. And boy, can I prove this one. A simple question. Think about this. What's your answer? Who is more content? The man with a million dollars or the man with 12 children? (laughs) What do you think? It's the man with 12 children because he doesn't want any (laughs) more. That's a joke. (laughs) But it's also true. Now, remember, Haman is bragging to his wife and friends. Haman's wife, just, she just plays right into this. Haman, why don't you build a gallows? Not just any gallows. You know what a gallows is. This is where you hang people to death, execute them. But make this gallows 75 feet, seven stories tall. And have Mordecai hanged on it. Now, meanwhile, King Xerxes wasn't being able to sleep that night, so he had his servants read to him some of the stories of the kingdom. And surprise, they read to him the story of how Mordecai had saved the king's life years before. And the king realizes, sermon note here, the king realizes that Mordecai had never been honored or never thanked for what he did. The word is honored. Now get this, this is fun. Haman shows up at the palace the next day, and of course he didn't know about the king's late night reading. And before Haman could get a word in, Xerxes asked him, careful of the language here, Xerxes asked him, what should be done for the man the king wants to honor? Remember, Haman's all puffed up with his importance. He's thinking, of course the king wants to honor me. Who else? Haman says, have them bring a royal robe the king has worn and a horse the king has ridden and put a royal crown on its head. And even that horse wears a crown. Let one of the king's most noble princes lead the horse through the streets proclaiming this honor. Now if this were a Bugs Bunny cartoon, you'd see Bugs going nudge, nudge, wink, wink and talk to the camera. He would say, all this for the man whom the king delights to honor. We all know who that is, don't we? Now imagine this moment. The king says, yeah, good thinking. Now, by the way, Haman, I want you to pull the horse for Mordecai. (laughs) Remember, the king didn't know who who it was that Haman wanted to wipe out. And it's all downhill from there for Haman. Esther holds that next banquet. She tells the king how she and her people are about to be destroyed. And the king says, who would do such a thing? He still didn't know. Who would do this? The wicked Haman, she says, our adversary and our enemy. And sermon sermon note. So Haman, Haman winds up being hanged on that very seven-story gallows that he had built for Mordecai. Now, You would think that's the end of the story. Not quite. Esther finally, at the end of this, reminds the king that that edict still stands against her and her people. And the king invites Esther to write a new policy. Mordecai becomes the new chief of staff, and the Jews are favored throughout the land. At the end of the book, many people of other nationalities committed themselves to the God of Israel. All because one man was willing to challenge that young beauty queen with these words, you have come to your position for such a time as this. And that woman who said no to a life of safety and security and said yes to following God. Boy, there are some lessons we could take away from this, aren't there? I'm going to list three that I want to pay attention to. First, even when it's not obvious, God is always, this is a sermon note, God is always at work, at work in his world. 
leading and guiding his people by the way of the Holy Spirit. Friends, we do not need burning bushes and pillars of fire and lightning bolts to trust that God is there. Second, just as he did for Esther, God calls each one of us to lead, lead, this is a sermon note, lead where we are. He's got plans for you and me too. Check Ephesians chapter 2. Paul says, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Third point, how do you learn God's plan for you? It's easy, just like Esther did. Remember, what was it? Three days. Three days of prayer, that's the sermon note, and fasting. Not alone either. She asked all of her people to join in, her friends, her servants, all of the Jewish people in the land. And the answer always, friends, starts with prayer. Always. The Jews were a step away from being annihilated, but God stepped in through Mordecai and Esther to rescue them. Even today, this is cause for a huge celebration with parties and gift-giving at the Feast of Purim. And for Christians, the story continues. Our greatest enemy has been defeated. So let us celebrate and live generously because God is faithful to his children. Amen.